Hi, I'm Florian Dueto. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dataiku. Uh, Dataiku is the enterprise AI platform uh, leading the world in terms of like making AI more easily uh, leverageable by large enterprise across the world. And uh, I have today with me uh, Clément and Matt uh, to uh, discuss uh, ChatGPT, or I would say more uh, large language models and generative AI. Uh, hi, Clément and Matt. Uh, would you introduce yourselves? To start with, Clément. Hi, my name is uh, Clément Stenac, and I'm uh, Chief Technical Officer and Co-Founder at Dataiku. And hi, my name is Matt Turk. I'm uh, an early stage uh, venture investor at Firstmark, which is a, a firm based in New York. And um, I am a very proud uh, investor and board member at Dataiku. So everyone is talking about uh, ChatGPT and generative AI these days, but a uh, lot of uh, stones are uh, left unturned uh, on that front. And I think our audience has lots of uh, questions uh, on this topic that uh, hopefully we can discuss and answer today. And so maybe to start with um, a fairly technical one, but I think that everyone is hearing about, uh, it could be for Clément, you've got lots of terms at play right now uh, related to uh, generative AI. Chat GPT, GPT-3, GPT-4, GPT-3.5, uh, LLMs, BARDs, BIRDs, Lambda, and so forth. <laughs> so uh, what, 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 what does it mean? Like, Clément, can you help us with a quick uh, disambiguation? Sure. So that whole field actually started uh, between 2015, 2018. And this is a field of what are called large language models or LLMs. The core idea of these models, so they are machine learning models that have been trained to predict next words in text. So the idea is that during the training process, the model has been shown immense quantities of existing text uh, from the web, from uh, questions and answers website, from code, etc., and basically has been trained and rewarded for correctly predicting what will be the next words in uh, text. And the sheer size of these models is, and the sheer amount of data it has seen makes it so that then it becomes able, without actually fully understanding what it's doing, it's able to produce statistically extremely probable text and the, uh, the, the fact that it uh, what arrives is that these models are able to create new text and especially when asked to do something. These models are then uh, further refined by having humans vote uh, on the output of models and feeding that back into the model in order to improve the model. And Again, this started a few years ago, and uh, there was uh, a, a subpart of these models are called GPT models. So it's really GPT is a family of models. There was GPT-1, GPT-2, GPT-3 that were built by a company called OpenAI. And then there was a lot of replication of these models in the open source community. And... What everybody has heard of, ChatGPT is actually a refinement of a model called GPT-3 that made it very uh, able at doing this question and answer, this very chat uh, interface. And again, we are seeing a lot of uh, other attempts. So you have Google who is creating Bard, who is like, uh, exactly like uh, ChatGPT. Uh, you have the new models called Llama from Facebook, uh, which are, again, variants of it. So there is really this idea of large language models that can create new text, that can basically follow instructions. Uh, and you have a ton of variants of them. And it's, of course, a, a field that is moving so fast that new terms, uh, new names appear on a weekly basis. Yeah, great. We've got new names uh, every every day or every week, and machines are generating garbage that is getting filtered by humans. So that's a very dystopian view. But yes. I think that we, we also hear about lots of uh, use cases of uh, such technologies in the enterprise. So for both of you, actually, what, what do you think are the top, uh, the top three use cases for the enterprise for those technologies? Matt, let's start. 
Um, yeah, so it's, I, I think I think the um, I think it's it's all a very new field. I think everybody is trying to figure it out at the same time. I think it's uh, one of those uh, very exciting moments in technology when uh, the pace uh, of acceleration of technology is actually taking everybody a little bit by surprise. Uh, both uh, in terms of uh, you know what to do with it, uh, but also how to um, make sense of it at a almost like a society and human level. Uh, so it's a little bit of a giant experimentation that uh, everybody's going through right now. Having said that, what's particularly exciting about generative AI as opposed to other waves of hype uh, in technology is that uh, there are a bunch of uh, fairly obvious applications, uh, both at the consumer level and the enterprise level. If you think of uh, the fundamental uh, thing that uh, all those models do is really create uh, content uh, and enable uh, people to access content in, in different ways. So uh, everywhere where there is content, both at the consumer level and in the enterprise, you're gonna find interesting applications of generative AI. Uh, one uh, super obvious application of it in the enterprise is around uh, code and code uh, generation. Uh, if you believe that uh, every company is becoming a software company and every company is becoming a data company and an AI company, uh, we are actually in a world where we probably have uh, not enough code as opposed to uh, too much code. Uh, there is a bottleneck around the number of engineers and data scientists that you have in the world. Uh, I think uh, Generative AI offers an incredible opportunity to enable all sorts of people that may not have, uh, you know, fundamental training in computer science to help create code. Uh, as we know, Generative AI um, uh, has a tendency to uh, make up stuff, what's known as hallucination. Uh, so it's not at a stage yet where it's going to be able to create perfect code every single time. But it is at a stage where it can help you get 80% of the way uh, and do a lot of the grunt work. And you, as a, as a coder, as a developer, can then correct whatever came out uh, of the generative AI model in a way that will just completely uh, accelerate your productivity. So coding is one example. Uh, but all the other uh, parts of the enterprise where you have content, which is pretty much everything, you're going to have an opportunity to use generative AI as a co-pilot to help you be more productive and create more stuff better, faster. So you can think of it as marketing materials. You can think of it as sales enablement. You can think of it as internal communication. Uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, every part of the enterprise, uh, wherever content is uh, involved from uh, video to a simple email or a Slack uh, message uh, can be dramatically improved with generative AI. The, as a software engineering leader, uh, the, code, uh, the code part in need resonates a lot. Uh, and and it's, it's really interesting, and it's here that there is uh, really uh, distinguishing the, the noise from the reality is, uh, is difficult because it is incredibly good at reproducing common stuff. So indeed, when you ask it to do coding tasks that are quite generic, so for example, starting an application, it will work incredibly well. It will, it will work scarily well, to be honest. Uh, you could say, uh, okay, are uh, software engineers doomed? There is, there is still a long way to go there, uh, but I fully agree with that idea of uh, seeing generative AI not as something that will write the code, not as something that will replace, but really as an assistant, as a productivity enhancer. And we've started uh, at, uh, at the Take R and uh, making a few experiments there. There are still a lot of questions uh, around reliability, around uh, legal aspects, etc. But this assistant uh, aspect is indeed uh, very interesting. There are a lot of traditional, in a way, tasks in natural language processing that can suddenly become much faster and much better. It is very common to have a lot of content. For example, uh, you, you have a product and you get user reviews and you want to identify the core trends, the core topics in your reviews. 
this is not something new. Uh, this, is a, this is a field that has existed for uh, pr probably 20 or even 30 years. Uh, but the, the recent advances in not just generative AI, but large language models in general have made these much faster, uh, much more precise, and uh, importantly, requiring much less manual input. It used to be the case that you need to have tons of either highly specialized people or tons of data that gets manually labeled. The real uh, revolution of these models, you may uh, hear it uh, referred to as few-shot learning, is that, again, it has accumulated so much, quote, knowledge that it can very, very quickly generalize. <coughs> Meaning that uh, it only needs a few examples of what you want to accomplish to understand what you what you want to do so yeah typically extracting root causes from incident reports extracting key topics from product reviews becomes incredibly uh, faster so so you mean for instance it is that uh, if i'm a big uh, consumer good of a retail company and that uh, i would want to extract uh, key topics from uh, customer reviews in order to find uh, uh, best next, next actions or accelerate uh, processing of uh, complaints. Uh, building such use cases would take, I don't know, uh, 100 days or 1,000 days before, and that with uh, generative AI, it takes, uh, what, 10 minutes, one hour, 10 hours? How, how much is, how, how would you quantify the acceleration? It, it's difficult. The, the thing is that, and that's a danger actually, you can get an answer in 10 minutes, that, that's for sure. And, but that's, again, probably more of a danger because one of the facts of generative AI, and it's related to what Matt mentioned about hallucination, is that it will always have an answer for you. But very often, that first level of answer will either be very uninsightful or very wrong. And so you still need... Uh, and you may uh, hear it refer to as prompt engineering, you need to fine tune how you will ask your question. The, the AI is still very sensitive to how you ask the question, mm -hmm. how you formulate examples. Basically, you need to show the model what you want, and this is still a skill that is being learned. And there are already people trying to use AI to, uh, to do that uh, kind of uh, inception. Uh, kind mm. of. Talking about uh, the way you talked about uh, the, 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 the potential, let's say, risk uh, associated to those products, uh, we can easily imagine that with generative AI, you could have startups uh, building uh, new products that, uh, and those products would be looking like working very, very well, uh, potentially initially, uh, for some examples, but potentially behind the scene, it could be very hard to understand if they really, really work well at uh, scale. So isn't it scary, uh, Matt, when uh, looking at uh, new generative AI startups? Because it could be very easily uh, uh, getting to areas where uh, you get tricked into something that seems to work but do not really work. Yeah, I have a little bit of a mental model around this, um, which is um, could be a two-by-two two matrix or a three-by-three three matrix. Uh, but... What, what I uh, care about when I evaluate whether uh, generative AI is, um, or AI in general, frankly, um, uh, apt at uh, a certain task is, is a combination of uh, does it need to be right? Does the outcome of what comes out of the AI, does it need to be right 100% of the time or not? Um, does uh, is is the the result? Do you need to have it in real time or not? Uh, and then is this a, a low stakes or high stakes kind of situation? Uh, and where I'm going with this is that um, fundamentally, as we started discussing already, uh, AI, whether generative AI or not, is a predictive technology, and um, it it uh, is amazing at providing answers that are right 80% of the time, 85, 95% of the time, but not 100% of the time. Uh, and that's a fundamental aspect of, of it that um, I think a lot of people that don't spend that much time in the space or are new to the space are, are, are discovering. So uh, long-winded way of saying, 
um, AI is going to be uh, absolutely not the right technology if you need something that needs to be right 100% of the time in a high stakes kind of situation. So, uh, you know, you are in the ER and somebody is a minute away from dying and um, uh, a judgment call needs to be made based on all that person's uh, data and you need to, uh, you know, a system to give you an answer that 100% of the time will tell you what you need to do right now and it needs to be right and this is automated. AI is, is just nowhere near uh, good enough to do that yet. Uh, so that's an example of a high stake situation. Another example of a less dramatic uh, but uh, you know important uh, high stake situation uh, that uh, comes to mind is you know a your calendar. Uh, and I've learned this uh, the hard way by working with companies that were working on those problems. Uh, but um, you know an AI assistant to help you schedule a meeting. Uh, is a, is a, actually a high stakes problem where you do need to get it 100% right 100% of the time because uh, you know uh, if uh, the AI um, schedules a meeting uh, next week and really the meeting was this week it's just not cute and then you know pretty pretty painful. Um, so at the other end of the spectrum, AI is really good at all the other situations. So um, a situation where uh, if you get it right, 90% of the time is just amazing. So we're just talking about coding. Uh, you know, this is not real time. Uh, you don't need to get your code perfectly right at this exact second. Uh, and uh, if the AI gets you 80% of the way there, it's like it's a massive win. Um, if you need to organize your pictures, uh, and uh, you know, uh, the AI um, uh, just correctly, correctly correctly um, uh, you know clusters your uh, photo uh, book into um, you know the right people and uh, you know currently classifies it uh, that that's that's uh, that's amazing so I think that's a good matrix to figure out uh, what um, AI is great at so again AI not good for like real time uh, sort of medical emergency type situation disaster uh, kind of situation. Uh, or even things like, uh, you know, accounting uh, that need to be 100% exact. Um, you, at a minimum, if you, you can use AI for to do the things, but you absolutely need to have a human in the loop. Uh, but then at the end of the, end of the spectrum, you know, fantastic uh, for all the other situations. To, but to, 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 go, to go back on that, for, uh, again, taking the example of, uh, of code, one of the issues that can happen is, yes, of course, if it gives you the correct code 80% of the time, that's already a massive win. If you, as a human, can identify which is the 80% and which is the 20%. And one risk that is very clear is if, as the AI will move from 80 to 95 to 98% correct, humans will stop caring, will stop verifying, will stop proofreading why, what the AI has done. And that's where you have, that, uh, you have that, that risk. So really, one of the huge things is it works as long as there is oversight, but the better it works, the less oversight it gets. Mm. And so, yeah, Clément and I are working in the same company. And so talking about human and high stakes problem, I think we focus a lot at uh, Dataiku on customer uh, support. It's like dear to our heart, the quality of uh, support. So, so Clément, do you think we could uh, automate customer support uh, one day or part of it? It depends, uh, meaning in B2C situations uh, where uh, there is a very large number of customers and um, most of them experience uh, the, the, the small number of very similar, very repetitive issues. Yes, probably. And again, the real challenge will be to tune the model so that it bails out when it's not sure. That, that's really the thing, and that's really the, one of the main issues right now with uh, generative AI, is that it doesn't know when it doesn't know. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, if we manage to fix that, it's easy to imagine that you can really solve and not just have a chatbot that basically just follows rules. You can really solve maybe 80, 90, maybe 95 percent of support tickets for uh, for uh, B2C or more simple use case. 
I do not think that, uh, unfortunately, for a large enterprise software, it will be that easy. Yeah, I, th I think I think B two C customer support um, is is uh, absolutely an area that's in the process of getting solved in an automated way. You know, several companies, um, including one in which I'm an investor called uh, Ada Ada Support, uh, I've been working on this for a long time, and this is just remarkable when you add um, LLMs, large language models, in the mix. Uh, it just uh, just gives a very impressive boost. Uh, you know, I'm I'm personally um, in a situation where, and maybe it's because I, I spend time in in the field, but um, uh, I'm I'm personally sick and tired of like speaking to humans and just being on the hold uh, for customer service for you know twenty minutes listening to music and like just like give me your bot and you know even even if the bot uh, doesn't understand every single time what what I uh, what I want, it's just such an incredible. Uh, gaining time, and um, I, I think that's where we're heading. Uh, I, I think uh, we're going to prefer interacting with AI uh, than uh, interacting with uh, humans. Mm. And, and Matt, do you think it has an impact uh, on the market in terms of uh, what kind of companies, or especially tech companies, will benefit uh, from uh, generative AI? Yeah, uh, so I think I think there's two uh, kinds of conversations here. Uh, there is one conversation around um, AI becoming part of everything. Uh, so all the existing tech companies are going to roll out AI in all their products. So you know, just the way when mobile appeared. Uh, mobile became something that uh, everybody did. Like everybody would uh, start uh, a mobile app, and you know, fast forward to today, uh, it's hard to think of any company, uh, especially consumer company, that doesn't have an app of some of some sort. So I think the same thing is going to happen, and um, it's actually already happening uh, incredibly quickly, uh, especially at the tech companies, because nobody wants to be uh, the company that did not roll out AI, generative AI, fast enough. So you're seeing Microsoft uh, very impressively just rolling out uh, AI to like their vast suite of, uh, of products. Uh, but just yesterday there was the announcement uh, that uh, Canva, after announcing it a few weeks ago, actually released a bunch of uh, features into their suite. So you're seeing it all over the place. That's just the beginning. Uh, AI is going to be a uh, necessary and an expected feature in every single product. The second part of the conversation is uh, startups, and um, uh, you know there's a lot of discussion in uh, VC circles and founder circles around. Okay, if AI is going to be everywhere, uh, on the one hand, and everybody's going to be releasing their own AI version, uh, and if on the other hand um, you have a handful of companies, the open AIs of the world, that are the arms providers to this old uh, gold rush, or you know. Uh, provider of, of, of uh, picks and shovels in the gold rush, then where is the blue ocean in terms of like creating new companies? Uh, my sense is that there is an immense uh, universe of opportunities there, and um, you know startups uh, and founders again and again will find a way to build uh, great companies. And just the way in the mobile revolution. Uh, yes, you had uh, everybody deploy mobile and mobile apps, but you still had uh, amazing companies that were built on the very uh, specific capabilities of mobile. So I'm thinking of Uber, I'm thinking of DoorDash that leveraged the quintessential um, uh, innovation of, of mobile. I think we're going to see the same thing in this phase of generative AI where uh, people are going to build uh, native generative AI companies to do things that uh, we may or may not even be able to imagine today. Mm. Yeah, because indeed there was like a lot of the investor market that was about looking for companies with a, a specific uh, business model and notably a subscription model in the enterprise in the past. And so to some extent, it seems no, no longer to be about it. But uh, uh, do, do you think we're coming to a day where uh, it would be a lot more about uh, technology differentiation in many fields of uh, deep tech, climate, AI? Or do you think that on the contrary, because AI, uh, some AI technologies are leveling the play field, it will be back about uh, finding the right business model, leveraging uh, technologies that are to some extent commoditized? 
I think it's going to be uh, a combination, and um, I, I, I don't um, necessarily think that there is a, a good way or bad way of going about it. Um, there is a, as part of that uh, very new uh, generation of generative AI companies, there's certainly a category of companies that, um, at least in investor circles, get a little bit of bad press, which is that, um, you know, the Jasper of the world. So Jasper being a, a generative AI based content creator that you can use for marketing, that you can use for emails that basically sits on top of um, of gpt um this like that whole group of, of, of companies that are you know to your point very much about the business model and the go-to market when really the intelligence of the system is provided by somebody else and there's a lot of discussion around okay well that's just a thin layer uh, can you really build a good company can you build a defensible company but by the way jasper is um, above 100 million in uh, in revenue uh, which is uh, you know very mm. impressive and just that demonstrates that you you can indeed build a, a company on top of uh, somebody else's intelligence mm. like that but you know can it be defensible over time my general take on on the um, on these categories that uh, I think people are, are being a little harsh on it. Um, I think a lot of those companies are basically going to look like SaaS companies. So you're talking about, uh, about subscription models and they're not going to be like any more defensible or any less defensible than a SaaS company. Uh, and uh, the way a SaaS company differentiates is uh, and, and builds defensible advantages around uh, you know, workflow and collaboration and, uh, you know, building a customer base and building a community around the product. So I think, you know, the, there will be a next generation of SaaS companies that will be generative AI powered SaaS companies. And I think that's, that's interesting. Uh, having said that for anybody that does not do that, um, and actually wants to build a real, uh, you know, native AI company. Uh, where you develop some of your own AI, I think people, uh, a lot of people at least, misappreciate how much of a deep tech effort that is, uh, and how AI, for all the hype and the tweets and the blog posts, uh, is still something that's really, really hard, and that uh, only a tiny group of people around the world uh, know how to do, how to build, uh, how to uh, leverage. Um, and uh, I think this new generation of generative AI companies are going to relearn that. It's like it's 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 hard, and you probably need to spend the first uh, two to three years of the life of your company actually building stuff, building models, building technology around the model. Um, so uh, I think we're going to be in this world of um, polyglot persistence, for lack of a better term. Uh, where you have a variety of different um, different uh, business model, uh, including yes, uh, the, the the return of a certain type of companies that um, are based on deep tech, um, which uh, you know is never easy, but um, ultimately is a wonderful way of building uh, great uh, companies that are defensible in the long term. Mm. But uh, so indeed, all of those technologies. Oh, oh. <clears throat> But indeed, all of those companies are based out of uh, uh, working with uh, OpenAI or uh, others. And actually, uh, it raised lots of questions uh, in terms of uh, licensing and defensibility and uh, wha what you can use or not and uh, which models are open versus not. So, uh, Clément, what's the current situation actually? Just as you describe, uh, everybody is wondering. So. First of all, uh, the, the most well-known uh, models, so the OpenAI models, GPT-3, ChatGPT, GPT-4, are trained on a huge corpus of text, but the uh, licensing of the text that has been used to, to train is itself a bit unclear. And there is something quite unclear about when you train an AI model with a lot of text and it generates new text, what is the copyright status of this new text? And that's still a very undecided uh, question. Then, of course, OpenAI is a company that does not do OpenAI. Um, so, of course, uh, there are 
worries, questions, concerns about the hegemony of OpenAI uh, in that new world. We are already seeing competitors to OpenAI emerge, but of course with a similar, uh, rather closed business model. What is extremely interesting is that there is already a lot of work, a lot of interest in research, in open source about replicating the deep tech uh, behind, uh, behind uh, OpenAI. There is still a significant gap. The challenges around the data that is being used to train these models remains one. There is also a question of cost. These models are so huge that training these models requires incredible amount of computation time, which costs money. It is estimated that training GPT-3, GPT-4 costs several millions of dollars. So not everybody can uh, do that. And yes, these costs will go down, but we are not there yet. So at the moment, OpenAI and similar companies remain at the forefront. Uh, so they remain gatekeepers to an extent, and it will be very interesting to see, uh, to see how uh, it evolves. Yeah, so the situation is still in flux, but so uh, are you both uh, already comfortable still to be to be using uh, those tools personally? Uh, Clément, do you use it to code? Uh, Matt, do you use it to make investment decisions? Uh, I use ChatGPT very often, but 90% of my uh, usage is uh, just to make uh, jokes and uh, to, to ask uh, fun questions. Uh, Matt, don't tell us that your jokes are actually coming from JGBT. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, not not yet. Yeah, I, I do use um, ChatGPT a, a bunch, uh, mostly experimenting with it as opposed to really having it part of my workflow just yet. Uh, I just try to use all those tools because um, it's part of the job. Um, you know, I use uh, Synthesia, uh, which is uh, an AI-powered uh, video platform where I've created my own avatar and uh, just like use it for communication as, as, as well. But uh, you know, this 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 whole thing is it's it's it's, it's really amazing because uh, ChatGPT and um, large language models have have sucked the air out of the room in terms of that's why we all talk about. But the reality is like ChatGPT is what four months old now. Uh, so, you know, the release of it. So uh, I think I think we're all um, trying to figure out how to build all of this into our daily workflows uh, yet. But it's, um, uh, you know, I, I, I certainly cannot imagine that uh, over the next 12 months or so, this is not going to be a core part of uh, my, my daily workflow. I'm trying to figure it out, but the, the outcome doesn't doesn't feel like it's in question. For example, th things for which I actually do use ChatGPT for work are uh, naming things. It's a well-known uh, trivia uh, that in software engineering, naming things in, is hard. And ChatGPT doesn't give an answer, but you, you, you can um, suggest things, get hints, uh, follow leads, etc. And it helps. Again, it's a tool, uh, just like uh, I, I previously used a lot, uh, just uh, Caesarus. And now I just ask questions uh, to ChatGPT. And I am not using ChatGPT to generate content, but I am using it to summarize content because sometimes you get very long content with lots of very complex sentences. And actually the real stuff is only like uh, one sentence, uh, two or three core ideas. And for this kind of use case, yes, it's not, it's not uh, exactly like you said, Matt, it's not a terrible problem if it misses one thing. But yeah, summarizing long emails into, okay, this is just what you need to know. Yes, I use that. So we will be able to use it as part of our day-to-day uh, -day workflow in three months if it uh, does still exist. Because uh, as we record uh, this uh, session, there was a pause uh, being asked, uh, I think a few days ago, uh, thousands of people uh, asking for a pause of research on uh, giant AI models. So what's your take on this? I think it's naive, meaning uh, if some people uh, say, okay, let's pause, other will not pause. 
So there is no incentive for anybody to do it, meaning I, the only way this could happen is through regulatory uh, oversight, which does not seem like something that could happen soon. Yeah, I, I agree. I think I think it's a little bit um, of uh, sort of like press and PR, kind of like hoopla. Um, at the same time, it, it is asking the right question. And I, I, I do think um, uh, that um, we're clearly in a situation where society and the legal framework and everything is just like way behind uh, the, the pace of acceleration. Uh, of progress over the last few months and um, you know I don't think anybody's going to actually pause but um, there is I mean it expresses very well this uh, discomfort that we can all feel which is that like it's like every day there's a new thing uh, and there's certainly pressure from the market uh, to do more faster um, you know, it's, it's very interesting to me that the, the fact that um, uh, Microsoft, uh, you know, released Bing with uh, GPT built in it, uh, and that Google had to follow suit. Uh, for me, the, the genius of Microsoft working with OpenAI was precisely that uh, you know Microsoft as a big company has a, a reputation to uphold uh and needs to be very careful and very deliberate in how it rolls out things and the whole beauty of working with open ai is like okay well we, we sort of the de facto backer of that outfit and yeah they can take risk but like everybody understand that it's a it's, it's a startup uh and like somehow i guess the the pressure of the market was so was too strong and they couldn't resist and they rightly uh saw that it was their opportunity to maybe have a chance at like getting uh you know, back in the ring with Google on the search front. So they just sort of rush it to market. Uh, and then, um, you know, Google had to react. So Google, which had been very careful in rolling out uh, their AI stuff publicly, and you, know, you know, spoke at length and published at length about the dangers of releasing AI in the world before it was fully baked. They too had to succumb to market pressure and push at BARD, which... Um, uh, you know, by all accounts, is just not fully baked uh, at all. And uh, that market pressure and the fact that everybody is now rushing to push stuff that is less and less baked uh, is scary. Uh, and uh, I do think that collectively we need to think about it. And I think there's an urgent need for, uh, you know, industry collaboration around it, which, again, this letter, this pause, ill-conceived through it may be, uh, is a you know is a step towards um, and then um, you know the EU AI Act and and all the things uh, that that needs to happen sooner rather than later because um, you know without a doubt all of this is uh, incredibly powerful technology and uh, we need to figure out how, how we're going to harness it as a as a, as a society and as a world. I think to some extent something that can be even more scary for real than large language model is large image models. Uh, so uh, Mid Journey version 5 was released, uh, so an image generation uh, model version 5 was released just a few days ago. And uh, as we record this, uh, there are some protests in France. This is a common occurrence. And there has been some clashes with police. And in the past few days, literally just in the past two days, there have been several occurrences of images of violent clashes with police that circulated on social media that generated a ton of inflammatory comments about police violence, about protesters' violence. And these were fake images generated by AI. And it also generated the opposite, that real images were dismissed as being wrong. So... On images, we have just entered, uh, so it has always been the case that uh, Photoshop and that uh, image edition techniques existed, but the new thing is that extremely good image edition is now available to everybody and not just to a few experts, and that is quite a change. 